I'm Lynette Anderson, and I work with the Bellwin Conservancy. Who's heard of Bellwin Conservancy? Okay, that's good. Glad to hear it. Uh, I am an interpretive naturalist. Things I do educational walks and talks, bird hikes, frog walks, prairie oh. hikes, you name it, I'm out there doing it. And I also get to do a lot of the restoration work. So Bellwin's um, mission is to inspire and engage a connection with the natural world. And we also then, as part of our work, we do a lot of habitat restoration. Um, so <clears throat> tonight we're gonna focus on uh, bison, but we're also gonna talk a little bit about Bellwin. So just in case you don't know where we are, we're about 12 miles, roughly 15 minutes from right here, just straight down Stagecoach Trail or Highway 95. That's 22 minutes from St. Paul. And then uh, if you look, let's see, can I do this? With, I'm not a PowerPoint princess yet, but I aim to be at some point. So uh, this is Lakeland. Of course, this is the St. Croix River. Here's St. Mary's Point and uh, St. Croix Beach. Afton is down here off the map. Woodbury over here. And of course, this is 94 right here. And then this is Hudson Road right here. So Bellwin owns roughly 1,500 acres, seven different parcels, all very different habitat types. And our work in each of these parcels is to bring back uh, as close as we can on the native habitats that were here prior to European settlement or uh, whatever we call it now. <laughs> um, so uh, this is an important slide because you can see the green, um, the green land holdings of Bellwin over here, very close to the metropolitan area between two major rivers, the Mississippi River on the left and the St. Croix River on the right, which makes us a really important area for uh, migratory bird species. Mm -hmm. uh, we're an excellent stopover point for um, many, many, many different species of birds. And um, let's see, did I wanna say more about this? No, nope, I think that's enough for that. Uh, and this is a little closer view <coughs> of all of our land holdings and um, this is actually a pre-European arrival map of the native habitats that were here uh, prior to 1850. So the light brown over here is all prairie habitat. The dark brown openings are your oak savanna, oak barrens. And then down here in the green, this is all big woods. And then a little bit farther to the north, of course, are, is the boreal forest. And so Bellwood is uniquely situated right in an area called the transition zones. So uh, all those different habitat types kind of merging together in this particular spot right next to the St. Croix River. So this all started, Bellwood started with uh, Charlie Bell, who was the CEO of General Mills and his wife, Lucy Winton Bell, they lived in Wayzata. All their friends back in the early 50s were getting places up in Brainerd or Ely or Duluth, you know, a lot of, lot of driving. They wanted to find a retreat place for their family uh, that was less than two hours away from Wayzata, had pine trees and running water. They had a friend who was a real estate agent in Afton, long story short, this guy on um, this property and a gentleman named Spike Spreeman owned this and he was being pressured to develop it. It's just right north of Athens, beautiful site. And he said, I'll only sell it to somebody who's got swamp water in their bones. <laughs> and he met Charlie Bell and shook his hand and they talked and you know, exchange stories. And he said, this is the guy, he's got swamp water in his bones. So he sold the land to Charlie and Lucy and that land is now, oops, where did my cursor go? There it is, is right down here in this area. So this is still owned by the family. It has the confluence of the North Branch of Valley Creek and the South Branch of Valley Creek. And it's about 65 acres. So this is the late 50s now that they've purchased this property and they're, they built a nice cabin there. And as Charlie <clears throat> would come out and spend time there, he would wander around and go hiking and meet the neighbors and talk to them and get the lay of the land. And as parcels would come up for sale, 
he would buy them. And so he started, oh my keys on this cursor. Uh, he started kind of moving north and east and purchased a lot of this property right in here, which is now our education property. And that's about 265, 270 acres. And um, when he got to that large amount of acreage, his daughter, Lucy, and his wife, Lucy, both said, what are you going to do with this land? And he said, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. But what I do know is this kind of land in this close proximity to a major metropolitan area, it's going to be important to save it. Yes. It's just going to be important to save it. I don't know what we're going to do with it. Come on in. I just know that we need to protect it. Good for him. Is he still alive? He is not. Okay. He died in the early 2000s. So <clears throat> as he was thinking about um, what to do with this land, his friend, Clifford French, the French Regional Park in the Three Rivers Park District, um, Charlie said, you know, I've been looking for Boy Scout groups or Girl Scout groups or YMCA groups. And just, you know, I can't seem to land on any particular group, but I do know I want to have nature education for youth happening here. And Clifford French said, you know, you really ought to talk with St. Paul Public Schools. They're looking for a field site for their high school biology students. So the teacher's name was Rod Fry. He came out, he met Charlie, they walked the land, Rod fell in love with the place. He said, oh my God, we love to do this. And out of that, we have a still ongoing 50 plus year relationship with the St. Paul Public Schools where kids come out and spend a whole day doing outdoor learning. And it's a, it's a phenomenal program. So here is Charlie Bell and his wife, Lucy. And this is a representative from the St. Paul Public Schools. And at that time, they combined Bell with Winton because his wife's name was Lucy Winton Bell. And they came up with Bellwin. And it was originally called the Bellwin. Oh, where did that Bellwin. Go? Bellwin. Outdoor Education Laboratory. It's not called that anymore. Now it's Bellwin Outdoor Science. But that was the original um, name of the place. And here they're um, congratulating, you know, being congratulated about this donation because they didn't sell it. They donated mm -hmm. the land. And then this is Charlie Bell, his son, grandson, David, and his daughter, Lucy. And what's important about this picture is that Charlie really engaged both his daughter and grandson in a conservation mindset. So he was really, he worked really hard to pass on this idea that nature education and conservation of native habitats is really important. He did some of the first uh, prairie restorations on the Bellwood properties way back in the 70s, which is, that was like, groundbreaking at that time. So um, out of that partnership, that kind of became the template for other partnerships that Bellwood has to this day. So uh, this is the uh, original building that Bellwood built for the St. Paul Public School students. And it's still standing and still pretty much like this, a few changes here and there. But uh, for this particular partnership, Bellwood provides the building, the heat, the water, the electricity, the trail work, and then our partner, St. Paul Public Schools, provides teachers, materials, and busing. So mm -hmm. no money crosses hands. It's just a, it's a wonderful win-win template for a great partnership. Back in the day when it started, it was one instructor with small groups, and the kids are mostly inner city St. Paul who have no idea what it's like to be out in the woods. <laughs> and I taught this program for 14 years, and I can tell you this is a pivotal day for every single kid that comes out there. Still going strong today. This is a group uh, that are up at our bison prairie, and you can see the bison pelt in the background. They're learning about some, some bison stuff. Still small groups. We try to keep it one for 10. <clears throat> they also do important things like plant pollinator gardens, so mm -hmm. pretty wonderful thing there. And then on that same property, um, the Minnesota Astronomical Society has their one of their observatories there. And uh, so we have a partnership with them. And inside is a, one of two 10-inch refracting telescopes in the state, really large. And when we have events, evening events, 
uh, the astronomers are kind enough to come and open up the observatory and show us the wonders of the night sky, which is really cool. And during the day, they have solar filters for their telescopes, so the kids can go out and look at solar flares. And so that's a great addition. And again, a nice partnership where they provide all their stuff. We provide infrastructure. No money crosses hands. And it's just this great, great partnership. So this is David Hartwell, Charlie's grandson. And he, like his grandfather, saw development pushing in and uh, wanted to protect this landscape. So he also, like his grandfather, went out, um, made connections, had conversations, met the neighbors, got the lay of the land. And from the late 80s, really 1990s, up to current day, he then expanded Bellwin from just this 265 acres to all told now 1,500 acres. So here's the original property of the family. They still own it. And now um, this is what we call the teaching property or the education property. And that's specifically for the St. Paul Public Schools and some Stillwater schools bring their kids out. Um, and then we do special programming there. So I just did a Be a Better Birder hike out there. We have frog walks there. We had an evening wetland hike. Uh, so there are ways to get the public in there. Stunning topography. Um, I know that you said you do hiking. So do you go to Stagecoach Prairie to do your hiking there? Yeah, some of it. And I, to be honest, sometimes I just go up to the tower. Yeah. And just sit there and read or whatnot. Mm -hmm. At the Bison Prairie? Yeah. Oh, but I great. didn't realize that it, I had no idea how vast the property was. This is crazy. Yeah. yeah. And I just want to say, too, if you have a question, just throw it out there because, you know, I, I like to answer questions instead of just blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Although I do like to do that, too. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. The, um, the astronomy globe, mm -hmm. where is that again? That's down here on the education property. And when we have evening events or um, the MAS might have star parties, you can check their website for that. But that's when you can get into the, um, the observatory. So, uh, yeah, and we can talk um, also about when those evening events are and how you can come to them. Cool. Yeah. Can you get your name on an email list? You can get on an email list, absolutely. You can go to our um, website, bellwood.org, and sign up to get, we send out a bi-weekly um, e-blast with information about our programs and events coming up. And there's a blog on there, Notes from the Land, that talks about what's happening. And Lynette left some literature out in the front. Yeah, I think so, you picked up the newsletter. Oh, there you go. Cut <laughs> off the presses. That's our brand new oh. newsletter. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. What's the web address again? <clears throat> Sorry, Bellwood.org. Bellwood. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we can come back and talk about each of these parcels a little bit later, but um, most of ours are along Stage Coach Trail, and this is our kind of outlier. This is uh, about 300 acres over here, and this is our little gem. It sits at the headwaters of the north branch of the Valley Creek, so it's on the north side of Lake Eda, where it's uh, known locally as Mays Lake. That's the lake right here, right there, <laughs> and uh, at that site, which is orange, um, we have one of the largest uh, oak savanna restorations, at least it was at the time in the 2010, one of the largest oak savanna restorations in the state. Wow. And it is stunning. And it's so fun to take people there. So if you go to our website and see an event happening there, sign up and come because it's, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, let's see. So the work that we do, um, we try to restore back to pre-arrival of the Europeans back to that native uh, habitat type. We can't always get it right because so much time has passed and succession has happened. But we, we use this as kind of a blueprint to help us get back there. <clears throat> and um, so when we're doing our work, we use prescribed burning. We do that usually in the spring. Yes. Uh, we hand pull invasives. Yes. That top left photo is uh, Grecian foxglove. It's a very tenacious, toxic uh, plant that we pull every year. We do seed collection in the fall. You can see that lower right picture. It has a hopper full of seed. We use seed that we gather on our own lands and 
then when we're doing, we're opening up other lands, we spread that out on our restorations. And then we have this amazing partnership with North Star Bison. So um, this is exciting. Did anybody come to the bison release on the 21st? Nice. Next year, put it on your camera. All right. <laughs> it's an exciting nanosecond event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, so um, uh, North Star Bison is a wonderful family-owned ranch in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. And um, they are phenomenal. In the early 2000s, Belwin was looking around to have bison on its property. One of its prairies, uh, bison are what's called a keystone species. Have you heard that term before? So a keystone species is an animal or plant that absolutely is critical in maintaining the integrity of that habitat. So for example, uh, woodpeckers in a forest are a keystone species because they create openings where other animals can spend the night or roots or nests. So white-breasted nuthatches and chickadees and flying squirrels and screech owls, they all use those woodpecker cavities as homes. If the woodpeckers weren't there, those animals wouldn't be able to survive and thrive. So a keystone species really, really adds a lot to that habitat. <clears throat> Does the whole system collapse if they're gone? Mm, maybe not, but it's not the same. And bison are a key stone species for the prairie. So um, when we were looking around, uh, we found a lot of different bison producers, but North Star is, um, their motto is good for the land, good for the animal, good for the people, which we love because you can't have anything without good land. And they also were the only um, producer around that does 100% grass-fed uh, animals. And uh, that's kind of a new and upcoming thing. Yeah. Uh, you'll probably hear about something called regenerative agriculture. And that is a part of this, is that um, grass is much healthier for the animal, much healthier for us to ingest. Grain-fed animals have a lot of different things going on. So. Um, and I'm not an expert, I'll just say I'm an enthusiast about this stuff. <laughs> so I can't answer all the questions, but I'll try. So um, when we decided to have bison on our prairies, we looked around at each of them and we decided on this one, right? Oh, where did you go? Right here, um, for a couple different reasons. So this was restored in uh, the early 2000s. So we had some good prairie restoration going on. There were good uh, good grasses growing in there, which is the bison's main food. And it was pretty well established with not a lot of issues in it. The only real issue we have in there is um, sweet clover, which we try and manage. Um, it's easy access, 94 Hudson Road. So mm -hmm. they can bring their stock trucks right over on 94, get off and come up on Hudson, come down stagecoach, then they come right down here to the farm. They back in, well, they drive in, and then they back into the field here, and voila, we've got bison released. So easy access and the established prairie were kind of the two parameters that we had for uh, where to put them. Can I ask you? Yes, sorry. You, yes, please. Um, can you tell us? The name of the people who own the farm? Yeah, Lee and Mary Grace, G-R-A-E-S-E. -E. They're amazing and they have five children. Uh, their youngest daughter lives in Texas on a ranch and all four of the other kids are all involved in the business. Marketing, social media, butchering, herd management. I mean, it's a, they're a phenomenal family. So they butcher the bison? They do. And they field dress them, and so they're and they're they're humane every step of the way, and they have the animal's best interest at heart when they're managing them over the course of their lifetime. They 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 have a great website, northstarbison.com, and it's worthwhile to look at them and read their story. It's so fascinating, and I just oh. have so much respect for the way that they're doing things. I grew up on a farm too, but that was quite a while ago, and it was a bison. <laughs> So um, in order to have the bison, we had to put some infrastructure in place. And so you can see, um, this is our initial fencing 
um, along here, and it's all hog wire, which is that kind of four inch square um, mesh, and then a one strand of barbed wire along the top. 3.6 miles of fencing we put in wow. to house the bison. If they really wanted to get out of there. Oh, they absolutely could. <laughs> and, they, and they have. Of course, yeah. Uh, and then we don't have an actual source of water. So we have a well that brings water up into the stock tank. Huh. And that's one of the reasons we only keep them May through October. We don't have supplemental feed mm -hmm. and we don't have a winterized watering source. So they come mostly just to be finished off um, over the course of the summer. This is our new fence, electric. Um, and this was um, a request by the Department of Agriculture for North Star that anybody who was housing their animals protect them with um, electric fencing. I don't know that this would stop them either, really. I mean, if they're gone, they're gone. We have fortified beets. And then we also supplement with a mineral. And this has a lot of trace uh, macro and micronutrients, um, a little added protein. Um, and when we started with them 15 years ago, they were using a cow supplement, but now there is actually a bison supplement mm -hmm. specific. So I think that's progress. And then every year in May, we have this amazing nanosecond event. <laughs> so it started out as the bison release. Now it's the bison festival because we have uh, vendors coming. We have um, native plant sales. We have music. We have food trucks. We, I mean, it's this big hoopla, again, for a nanosecond event. But it's a very, very exciting. This was our very first one. So the back end, people are lined up <clears throat> and you can hear the bison just, you know, <laughs> clamoring about in the trailer and they're making a lot of noise. And then one person's on one side and one's on the other and they lift the latch, and throw the doors open and thundering herd comes out and they look around for about a nanosecond and then <laughs> they're off to the farthest corners of the prairie. Oh, right. <laughs> and that's How many are released at one time? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, now we have, so our herd sizes vary uh, anywhere from 15 to 45 depending on um, what the drought maps look like and what North Star has for needs. Um, and in each truck, I think they had uh, roughly, this year there's 24. So each truck, they probably had you know, 12 or so. Oh, wow. Do they release all of them at the same time or like truck by truck? Well, we used to release them all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then because people were late getting there, we now <laughs> stagger it and have two times. So we do a 12 o'clock and a 12.15 or 12.20 so that people who are, you know, just coming in late, have mm -hmm. an opportunity to see it. Nice. So yeah, it's, it's so fun. Uh, the second year we had them, we put in an uh, ADA accessible platform with some educational signage. Mm -hmm. We built a 25 foot high observation tower. This is the new iteration of that. Mm -hmm. And then here's the herd of bison. <clears throat> Imagine 30 to 60 million not just a handful of this, but 30 to 60 million early 1800s traversing all of North America. How big is the area in which they roam? They have about 120 acres. 120. Mm -hmm. You've got what's like, what, 30 or 40 years? Yep. Like yep. So Where does the, the funding come from for all these additions, all these things you're doing? Well, uh, we fundraise for them. Really? Yep. Great question. Um, what's the whole event, then? Sorry. Yeah, special events and things. Like that. We yeah. do. Yep, we do, and we have uh, we have. Uh, well, it used to be called a membership. Now it's just a donor or a supporter. Okay. So you can uh, donate to Bellwin, and uh, you know, depending on what we need, that's where the money goes. So our funding, uh, we apply for grants, <laughs> state and local. We have this donor base that. Um, supplies about a third of what we need. And then we do have an operating fund through the Bellwin Foundation uh, that provides again about, so it's about a third, a third, a third. And then we do special fundraising. So for example, that tower that we built, we put out a special request. I forgot what we called it, um, but we fund, that cost about $25,000 all told. And um, we fundraised, or I'm sorry, 10. 
wrong, wrong fundraiser. <laughs> um, but we just put out a, a call telling people what we were doing and people just donated to that specific fund. So that's how we get some of that done. Yes. Who did you, sorry, one more question. Okay. Um, the signage that you had looked lovely. Who did you work with for that? We worked with an artist named Susan Reed. Okay. Um, we wrote all the text and found all the photos in house. And then we got all those to her. Uh, she used to be from St. Paul. Now she lives down in Roqua. Uh, she's doing less work now, but she's a fabulous graphic artist. Yeah. So um, this is what it might have sounded like on the ferry out there, minus the airplane. Oh, here's That's it's crickets, right? Crickets. Mm -hmm. The tail is there. Playing in there <laughs> That's good. Uh, they, do they, when you go up on the observation tower, can you see them at all times or are you just luck of the draw? You know, you can see them most of the time. There's one spot on the uh, northeast corner where there's a little bit of a dip. And if mm -hmm. they get behind that and down, you won't see them. Okay. Um, they, they move around all the time. So 24 hours a day, they're moving. They don't stay in this spot for today and then this spot for tomorrow. They're here in the morning, here in the afternoon here early evening here later evening here midnight over here so they have a <clears throat> so their pattern is they move and as they move they're pulling mouthfuls of grass they don't chew it because they're like a cow so they have a four chambered stomach so they're grabbing grass and swallowing grabbing grass so that's what they're doing while they're moving then they go over to the water tank and they hang out at the water and each bison will drink about 30 gallons of water a day Whoa. They also eat about 30 pounds of grass a day. Wow. So they'll walk and eat. They'll hang out at the water tower. Then they'll walk a little ways. And then somebody will send a message. And it's time to loaf. And that's the technical <laughs> term for everybody to lie down and chew your cut. So then they loaf for a while. be a bison. Yeah. <laughs> then they get the message. And one of them stands up. They get slaughtered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all fun and beautiful. Yeah. But they do have a nice life until then. Yeah. Right. Then they stand up and they kind of just hang out there while one stands up and then another one and then two and then four. They all get up at the same time. They take their time and then they'll start moving again and eating. So, and they'll do that 24 hours a day. In the evening and at night, they tend to be a little more gregarious. They'll because they're all males, they'll joust a little bit more and get a little pushy and do a little grunting and stamping uh, in the cooler part of the day. During the heat of the day, they're loafing a lot, uh, lying down, shade of the prairie grasses and the coolness of the earth are uh, keeping them at a comfortable temperature. So uh, benefits, why does Bell One have bison? Uh, well, first of all, because they're a keystone species, we wanted to bring back that really integral piece of the prairie puzzle. And it's uh, such a wonderful feeling to go out there and see them there and know that this whole food web is now complete and that they're doing their job at maintaining this small 120 or 30 acre parcel. It's a wonderful thing. So that was, uh, we wanted them for that reason and all the benefits that they bring. But then the overarching thing for me is that they have now given us um, information that tells us prairie restoration can be economically viable. Like you can spend the money and do the work to create a native habitat and raise a crop off of that <coughs> that supports a family and the workers who work for the family. So I, it's just a great thing. I think. So this is clearly a bedding area. All of these indentations in the grasses are all places where they were lying down loafing. And you can kind of see right here where there's bare ground exposed and there's a little bare ground exposed here. So as they're lying down, um, some of their fur is going to touch the ground and their fur has seeds in it. I'll pass that around. And the seeds can fall off 
And in those bare patches, the seeds can germinate. And this helps to just <clears throat> push back the grasses because they're very bossy and they're very aggressive. And if you can push those back and make way for the flowers, your prairie is going to be much healthier and much more diverse. More insects, different birds, different small rodents, uh, mammals, all those different parts of the food web. So even just the bedding, crushing of the grass is a help to the prairie. So interesting. Uh, they also do something called wallowing. Have you heard about wallows before? Yeah. Bears do that too. Yeah, mm -hmm. so where one wallows, they all wallow. So the bison will choose a spot, they'll lie down, and they'll roll, uh -huh. and they'll itch those insect bites and get that spare fur off, again, transporting the seeds. And then they'll get up and they'll shake, again, spreading the seeds. And then another one will come, and he'll do the same thing. And over time, that wallow is going to be compressed, the soil will be compacted, and you'll end up with a little divot in the ground that looks like this. And you can see where it's kind of uh, just kind of shallow and a uh, little indent there. Uh, water is really the limiting factor in a prairie. So when there's a rain event now with that compacted soil that's somewhat pond-like, that'll hold water for a number of days after it rains, which is a tremendous benefit, again, to the insects, the birds, the small mammals, the reptiles, even the toads that live out there. So that's another benefit that they bring to the prairie. And it diversifies it. So it's, again, you know, moving those seeds around, it's pushing those bossy grasses back. And then you end up with what's on the left lower here with those beautiful bergamot coming up. Soil enrichment from their, um, their dung. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this was another reason we chose this site. When these uh, two sections were planted, this was the first in 2001, it was planted very grass heavy. This is big blue stem. This is really one of two preferred foods of the bison, big blue and Indian grass. Mm -hmm. This half was um, planted in mostly forbs or flowers. And they were very distinct. You could drive out there and stand right here and go, wow, grasses, flowers, and never the twain shall meet. So we wanted to make that a little more homogenous across the line there. And they are doing that by just by the wallowing and the bedding down and the shaking, they're creating a, a better mixed prairie for us up there. And it looks like this. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. There's our bison, and you can see the grass is hanging out of its mouth. And bison are herbivores, which means they eat plants, right? They're similar to deer and beaver. And if you look at these three jaws, what do you notice that's similar about them? Front teeth are farther. Okay, what else? Teeth are jammed together. Okay, anything else? Is there a space anywhere that you see? Well, yeah. in, the, in the front? Of yeah, the jaw? right yeah. behind these front teeth, there's a big space there, big space here, big space here. So when they're grabbing their vegetable matter, whether it's twigs or grasses, there's a space there for them to just grab oh, and mm -hmm. then their big tongues push it back, and when that cud comes up, specifically for the bison, then they can have lots of space in here to mush that all around. So if you find a skull and it's got front teeth with a big space, you can say with absolute certainty, oh, well, that's an herbivore. <laughs> and you can impress your friends and family. <laughs> so I'll give you that. You'll be surprised at the weight of that. And if you mm -hmm. want to look at these, are you going to keep the uh, herd numbers about the same as they are now, or do you plan to expand? Well, <laughs> that's completely <laughs> that's up to you with more stars. So, um, depending on what the, the food looks like in the pasture, depending on what what they need for their animals, we've had as few as fifteen and as many as forty five. It changes every year. We can't take really many more than 
45 because of the, the size, the yeah, acreage of our fester. Right. Really big, but... It comes out to about two and a half or three acres per animal. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. When, when do they have their young? In, in the springtime. In the springtime in the prairie, uh, their gestation period's about nine and a half months. Um, rut is later in the year. And, um, you know, it's a lot, it's just a lot like cows. You said they're all male. Um, the one, that are yeah, we have mostly male. So um, bison come into sexual maturity at two years of age. However, um, uh, you know, they're, they're just young and North Star has a very specific breeding program. So they're looking all the time for those animals that they want to breed. And because they're a production uh, ranch, their their um, bison will all become a product meat product. Mm -hmm. They are only going to pick the cream of the crop out of their um, their bulls, mm -hmm. and then the rest are going to go up to market, kind of like steers mm -hmm. on a on a dairy farm. Uh, oh, let's see. We'll save that for now. <laughs> Are they dangerous in the rutting season? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. They're all, 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 I think all animals are. Uh, so you asked about, you know, they're not thinking straight. You know, they just have all those hormones uh. going through, like a bull moose or elk. Oh, they're very dangerous yeah. in the Elephant. rut. Mm -hmm. I don't know about, um, I don't think white-tailed deer so much, but certainly those other uh, animals are. Mm -hmm. Somebody just got gored in uh, Yellowstone yesterday. I just oh, heard that. Somebody want to help <laughs> Yeah. Not a good idea. Yeah. So, another benefit of bison on the prairie um, is their hoof action. So, they're ungulates, which means they have split hooves. And you'll notice that the bottoms are. Um, are pretty curved. And when they walk, they, unlike cows, which kind of plod and grind as they walk, these guys kind of mince, for lack of a better word. I mean, they, they're so, they're such interesting creatures. Their physiology is just really crazy. Here's a picture of their skeleton. How do those front legs hold up that? Right. I know. They Mass. have these delicate little dancer legs with this massive <laughs> little athlete athletes. body. But this is an actual hoof, and um, and you can just um, take a look at that. And that helps to aerate the soil. So the way that they walk, kind of, kind of like a mixer going back and forth, <laughs> you know, um, just churns up the soil, aerates it. And then what we've found, Another benefit for us is um, we have a Canada goldenrod, which is a native, but also very aggressive clonal roots that grow not too far into the ground. We had a really bad population uh, back in one of the corners of the them being back there walking the way that they do started to bust. And we have seen now a decrease in that population, which is good for us because now other plants like gray-headed coneflower and bergamot and some of those other cool plants can start to grow in there instead of having this mat of goldenrod. Um, what's one of the most noticeable, interesting things about a bison? Yes, they have a hump. And they have hump vertebrae. So camels have humps, but they either are filled with water or fatty tissue. Bison are all meat, so you can order um, hump roasts or hump steaks or whatever. And this is actually a hump vertebrae. So if you feel your back, these little bumps along here are like this. This is a deer vertebrae, and that's about the size of some of our lumbar vertebrae. Maybe a little, ours are a little smaller. But here's the bison vertebrae okay. compared to Deer vertebrae. Right? Wow. Holy moly. Yeah. Quite, <laughs> quite a difference. Quite a difference. How much do they weigh? Um, you know, the bison that we have this year came in 
pretty heavy. They're about a thousand pounds a piece. Um, they <laughs> typically have come in anywhere from 650 pounds to 750 or 800, and they put on two, 300 pounds over the course of the summer. By October, they're looking like finely tuned athletes. They're just absolutely gorgeous. Oh. Uh, so every part of the bison is utilized. They don't waste anything. And does anybody know which bone this might be? Is it a femur? It is a femur. Ding, ding, ding. ding. Good job. Oh, <laughs> so you can see how short that is in comparison to ours. Knee joint. And really stocky. These are really beloved by zoos. Why would zoos like femur bones from bison? Because you can't destroy them. Yeah, they're so dense. Mm -hmm. They give these to the big cats and they don't shred <laughs> or splinter. <laughs> so they make excellent, you know, gnashing mm -hmm. things huh. for the, the big cats. Um, let's see. Anybody like to eat ribs here? <laughs> 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 it's ribs like the Flintstones, the bison, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. So. Well, yeah, <laughs> one rib is a meal. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Wow, um, that's huge. Let's see, how I have no idea what I'm doing at time. You're doing great. <laughs> um, so one another thing I'd like to just talk about briefly are their horns. And what I have learned, this is probably one of the things that most astounded me, with all of the bison herds that we've had coming now, 15 years worth, no two horns are alike. <laughs> and it's kind of incredible. You'd think that, I mean, of course there's uniformity. And of course, when you look at them, oh yeah, they're horns and they look similar. But when you get up close to these animals, it's so interesting how some can be just a little bit cockeyed or one can have a tip that's a little bit bent or, I mean, mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, bison have horns and deer have antlers which ones fall off antlers, antlers fall off yep horns do not they come right out of the skull and you can see that here and then they have this sheath that goes over the top of it that's made of the same material keratin as your hair and your fingernail and they're inseparable you know, they're fused, um, but uh, just interesting. And then what do you think the Native Americans would have used the bison sheath for? Use a horn. Yeah, drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Can they make a horn sound on it, would they? Yes, I have a bison flute at my house. <laughs> of course you do. Yeah. What, 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 what else would this have been used for? Think heat. Smoking. Mm, maybe. Mm. Uh, powder. A chimney. Powder. Good thought. Powder. Chimney. I'm getting closer. <sighs> Flu. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so what was that? Smaller than there. Yes. So when they were moving from site to site, they would pick up embers from yeah. their fire and carry mm -hmm. them in the horn. First hand warmers. Super <laughs> interesting, I think. Wow. What yeah. what tried them? Native Americans were on that one originally. Here, yeah, uh, Dakota and Ojibwe. Oh, and okay. uh, I can't think of the tribe. It starts with a W, and I'm really embarrassed to not know. Wapa. 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 That, and actually, those were the people that lived on land that bison or that that Belwin owns now, okay. and we're grateful for them. Do any of them come back? Or? Well, uh, we have so we have uh, a number of partnerships with the St. Paul Public Schools and the Minnesota Astronomical Society and North Star Bison. And this last year, we. Um, entered into two new relationships, one with the Anishinaabe Academy out of Minneapolis. And they're using one of our sites for um, indigenous learning and we're super excited about that. And then the other um, entity that we've 
entered into a partnership with is the American Indian Family Center out of St. Paul. And they have a sweat lodge and a teepee and they're um, creating this amazing sacred site uh, right on Bowen land. So we're starting to work with those communities and so much to learn. My gosh, they have they have so many stories. So it's, is that great. all on your website? Yep. Yep. Oh, thank you. It is. It is. So I saved the best for last here, or at least it's my opinion that it's the best. <laughs> we have a guy on staff. Amazing. And um, the second year that we had the bison, our then director, Steve Hobbs, and gosh, you know, it'd really be nice to have something that could get people right out up close with the bison. I just think that would be such an amazing experience. And so Eric was watching a show one evening about Africa and it had a safari buggy. And he started thinking, come oh, on, you know, we've got that old truck bed out there behind the pool shed. Oh, and we've got that old Toro golf course mower that could be the engine. And so this whole thing is custom made. And it gets you right out up and close to the bison. It's so amazing. It's just an amazing piece of machinery. Wow. Oh, look at that. It's a canopy amazing. Yeah, and that's that's what it looks like when you're going out to see the bison. And even though we're just, you know, not even a mile from the freeway. And you can hear the freeway when you're out with the bison on the buggy, you are transported to another place. It's mm -hmm. calm, it's peaceful, it's quiet. You hear the birds, you hear the crickets, you watch the interactions of the animals with the landscape. There's just nothing like it. It's just profound. Mm -hmm. So how do you get on the buggy? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just barely beat me to it. <laughs> we do sometimes offer rides um, to the general public. We haven't done that since before COVID hit, so we haven't done that for a while. But if you donate at a certain level, and I don't know what that level is, I'm blanking right now, but if you donate at a certain level, then you can get a buggy ride and bring uh, it houses about 10 people or 10 adults can ride on there. You can bring your friends, you can bring snacks, you can bring wine and beer and spend, you know, a couple hours hanging out with the bison. It's so amazing. Are the bison at all interested in the vehicle or? Uh, you know, they've been around because there are, so there are production herds and there are conservation herds. <coughs> this is a production <laughs> herd. So because of that, um, there have been tractors bringing food out oh, in the wintertime. Yeah. Um, there have been, you know, there, there, there's stuff, machinery going on around them a lot. So they're fairly used to the machine. Sometimes they come up and sniff, but not often. Mm -hmm. Most of the time they just keep doing whatever they're doing, loafing or eating or walking. What a life. Um, <laughs> they do have, um, you know, a personal space, if you will. Like you can't, we, I can get, when they're loafing, if I'm out in the buggy, I can probably get, well, 10 or 15 away from them, which is pretty close. So, um, so they're used to it. It doesn't bother them. And we're out there working with our other equipment to track <coughs> ETVs and whatnot. So, uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, please. I interrupt you. No. I, I missed the distinction between uh, production herd and conservation herd. You talk about it for production, but is there a whole other, what's the conservation herd? Great. I'm glad you asked that. So uh, production herd obviously is for meat production, mm -hmm. a food product to sell to the general public. Conservation herds are for um, genetics and population addition. So we're trying to grow the population of bison. There were 30 to 60 million in the 1800s. We dropped down to about 1,000 and 1,900. Now we're back up to about 500,000 in production herds and about 50,000 in conservation herds throughout. So the conservation herd must be there 12 months a year, but the production herd is just in May and there's August, October. Is it? Uh, so North Star just has production herds okay, yeah. and they have some select animals that come to Bellwin from May through October. That's their Bellwin summer camp. 
Actually, <laughs> they're finishing off. <laughs> and then they go back to North Star, are acclimated for a month or two, and then they're slaughtered and butchered and sent to market. Conservation herds you can find at the Minnesota Zoo, the Zolman Zoo, oh, okay. Minneopa State Park, and Blue Mound State Park. Mm -hmm. And those are, most of those herds are 50 animals or less. Mm -hmm. And those are used for um, genetics and breeding, and then population stabilization and growth for population nationwide. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So have there been con um, conversations at Bellman to consider a conservation herd or to do something in partnership, for example, with the Minnesota Zoo? And I understand you have a water issue. But yeah, we just don't have the facility or the staffing to manage a herd year round. Okay. I mean, it's it, when they're eating happily in the summer and, and we just check their mineral and check their water. I mean, we check them daily, but we don't really have to do anything mm -hmm. other than watch them. And once in a while, they might get pink eye, and then we call North Star and they come and do their stuff. So um, we're just a place for them to be. And then we get to reap the benefits of the prairie stuff and the PR because people love to come and see the bison. Mm -hmm. and so we're happy to have them for that. What you're doing is working really well for what you have. <laughs> yes. Sounds like. Yeah. 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 Now, is the bison and buffalo the same thing? Great question. For us here in the United States, yes, it is. So there are two true buffalo, the Cape buffalo in Africa, Southern Africa, and the water buffalo in Southeast Asia. And those are two true buffaloes. They have different horns. Their body structure is a little different. They're a different genus than our bison. Um, when the early French explorers came in the 1600s, the only experience they had with large animals like that were the oxen in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, the French word for oxen is le bouffe. So, oh, le bouffe, le bouffe, bouffalo, bouffalo. So from the 1600s, they were buffalo, <laughs> the bouffalo. And then in 1735, roughly, um, whoever the scientists were decided they were bison, bison, genus, species. And so technically, they're a bison, not a buffalo. But interchangeable here because of the history of the naming. Did they get any kind of special status when they were named the, I think they're the mammal of the- They're the name. national mammal. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And our largest grazer. Mm -hmm. So they have very great distinction. And they, do they, they can't overgraze like cows do. They can. They can, okay. Uh, depending on how big the area is that you have them in, but their eating is different. So cows, latch on and pull mm -hmm. and they'll um they'll go right down to the growing tips right down to the ground and pull bison do not do that bison will go down to about this this far down on the grasses and the growing tips are either right under the ground or right level with the ground so those aren't damaged okay so as they're eating and they have a uh, tweezer like the way that they eat is tweezer like like mm -hmm. cows oh, oh, you know, mm -hmm. that, just that big glompy Bite. Bison are very more tweezer like. Mm -hmm. They grip, snip, pull. Uh, so the grasses are not damaged, and then that stimulates more growth for those grasses. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Do you know, are you seeing an increased number of farmers who are uh, getting bison and having bison herds as opposed to cattle? Uh, well, I think. I know that it's more mainstream now. You can go into more restaurants today than you could 15 years ago and order a bison burger. Uh, I think this whole idea of um, regenerative agriculture, which I don't know a lot about. There was a great um, interview this morning on NPR. Um, 1A had a great conversation about regenerative agriculture, which is the idea that we need to be healthier in the way that we farm. So paying attention to the soil, making sure that the animals are getting the good nutrition like the grass as opposed to the, the uh, you know, grains. Um, so I, I, and I also think that, uh, let me think about this for a minute. In 2010, 
can, I did a bison trivia sheet for our staff. And I think at that point there were 30,000 uh, bison in, oh no, I'm sorry, 200,000 bison in production herds nationwide between, actually between the US and Canada. Mm -hmm. Now the 2020 stats are that there are 500,000 oh, in production herds okay. and the conservation herds are growing. So nice. the first time I looked, there were 30,000 in conservation herds and in 2020 there were 50,000. Mm -hmm. So slowly but surely with more and more awareness and um, the love of this iconic, amazing mm -hmm. animal, uh, you know, we're getting, we're getting there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seriously, if you drive on 94 towards Menominee, there's a large bison herd on the right side of the road. Mm -hmm. so, Silver yeah. Creek, I think that, that is. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it's, production, I assume. Yeah. Yep, yeah. they are. Mm -hmm. You said that half a million right now is the current population up from very, very little the current century. But um, what's the optimal goal for the bison industry? Boy, that's a really good question. I don't know that, and I, but I do think the limiting factor is land. You know, there's a wide, there are wild herds in several different national parks: um, Teddy Roosevelt, Yellowstone, um, and and you just you know there's only so much land mass. And I know in Yellowstone, if the bison go outside yeah. of those boundary lines, they get shot. Mm -hmm. So, what about Ted Turner? He has an enormous. Yep, he has you know, a big herd. I yeah. don't know much about his though. Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, upcoming events or um, projects that you're excited about? Oh, it's invasive time. <laughs> and I had my little vase <laughs> of flowers that I was going to bring. And Purple I lace, right? <laughs> However, um, Garlic mustard, anybody familiar with garlic mustard? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the white flower that was growing all over last month. Now it's all going to seed. That is on the top uh, top five list of Washington County, I believe, for eradication. It's a, most of these invasives are non-native, so they come from someplace else in the world. They take over spots, disturbed areas, and then they just go nuts because they have no check. Mm -hmm. They have no disease. They have no critter that eats them. Garlic mustard is one of those. Dame's Rocket is another one. Have you been driving around oh, and you've seen those pretty curtains. pink flowers yes. in the ditches? They're everywhere. Watch the ditches for the next couple of weeks and you'll see this profusion of beautiful pink and purple mm -hmm. flowers. And they smell great and they make beautiful bouquets and they are so invasive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So if you have those on your property, pull those out. <laughs> well, pull them, put them in the trash. Um, as soon as they start to push seed pods, um, you know, even if they're can keep growing with the stored energy in the stems, the roots, and the leaves. So, um, so that's what we're doing. That's exciting yeah. now. We're we're doing invasive work. Um, let's see, what do we have for programs coming up? Well, I can't. People can also refer to your website. Yeah. I'm sure too. Yeah. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have deer tick out there? I'm just curious. We do. We definitely. I mean, do you have to warn your, your clients about putting stuff in their, in their pants in their shoe? I mean, I'm just curious. If, um, is it caveat on tour or are they actually educating the people out there? We do talk yeah. to people about that. They're, you know, they're on their own in terms yeah. of um, protective stuff. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we use a product called Repel. And we treat all of our clothes and our boots and our socks oh. with that before we go out. Is that uh, available to? Uh, yep, we get it at Fleet Farm. Is it called R E P? R E P E L. It's a green and orange can spray okay. can. And um, what I do usually is take all of my work clothes after they come out of the wash and are dried, and then I just spray them all, let them hang for about 24 hours so that it permeates, yeah. and then that's good for. I don't have to wash them. You know, I, it. It, well, it will last through the wash, but I just try and wear those for, sure. you know, a week or 10 days or whatever. And Does it kill the, the, uh, the creatures? It, 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 uh, so I had some on my pants one day and I was out doing a bird survey and I saw this wood tick and it was climbing up my pants. And I just watched it because I had just tried this product yeah. for the first time. So it made it up to my knee and then it made it up to about mid-thigh. 
and then it just kind of didn't know what to do. <laughs> Excellent. And it went kind of back and forth and turned around <laughs> and then fell off oh, my interesting. pants. Interesting. It was just great. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, <laughs> that's my sure. rappel story. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a tick magnet and I have not had one deer. I've had dog ticks and all the other ticks. I haven't had one deer tick this mm. spring. I don't know why. Get some so. rappel. Yeah. 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 I've had lines yeah. three times. So. Oh. Yeah, I picked about 10 off me today. Your distinction of wood versus deer, which is worthwhile. Deer are the ones yeah. that yeah, carry right, right, the right, disease. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's about all, all I have, unless you all have more questions. I'm so grateful that you came out tonight to hear about Bellwin and about the bison. I hope you'll come and visit. Mm -hmm. And on your way out the door, be sure you pet the pelt <laughs> and touch the skull. Is that the only time you're ever going to touch them? <laughs> <laughs> right. There's newsletters and um, trail maps by the door there. And That's great. Thank you so much. Can, can make it, little baby. Yeah. yeah.